Can I? Can I start by thanking everybody for coming along to our seminar tonight? And but I'm delighted to welcome John Weeks. John Weeks is Professor Emeritus uh, of Development Economics and former director of the Center for Development Policy and Research uh, at SOAS School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. His <coughs> most recent book, and he's published a great deal, but his most recent one is Economics of the 1%, How Mainstream Economics Serves the Rich, Obscures Reality, and Distorts Policy. Unquote. And this was published in 2004. Now, John's technical critique of mainstream economics is found in another book published in 2014, entitled The Irreconcilable Inconsistencies of Neoclassical Macroeconomics, A False Paradigm. Um, he has advised governments on macroeconomic policy, most recently the Central Bank of Zambia, his recent research work has involved analyzing capital flight from sub-Saharan countries in African Development Bank, an African Development Bank project, cross-country analysis of so-called structural deficits published in this year's review of political economy, and the global pattern of the post-2008 Great Recession. His non-technical articles frequently appear on Open Democracy, Conversation UK, Pleria, and the Real News Network. And he has a blog column in the Huffington Post. And tonight he's going to talk to us about acute deficit disorder, cause, treatment, and cure. John, the floor is yours. Thank you. I particularly want to thank Philip, in addition to his um, extremely important uh, empirical and theoretical work. He has been a uh, consistent <coughs> patron of um, <coughs> people with um, uh, heterodox ideas, and as a result, has made our profession stronger. And so, it, therefore, it is an honor to be here and speak. <coughs> um, I'll cover three topics. First, I'll have to say in May there's going to be an election in which austerity will be a major issue, at least I certainly hope it is. And um, so first I'm going to deal with it, present some facts. Uh, then I'll make some theoretical points and I'll finish up by saying uh, what we need to do. Uh, I think I can, um, uh, let me see if I'm clever enough. Yes, there we are. There are the two books uh, um, that uh, Philip referred to. Before beginning, I might set the context. The other day, I, not the other day, about two months ago, I was at a uh, dinner meeting in which there were a number of uh, people discussing um, uh, austerity policies in Europe. And I said that um, in almost <coughs> every country uh, in the European Union, um, in the Eurozone and out of it, that uh, deficits were a problem of growth. And that if the economy grew, they would generate more tax revenue, and generate tax revenue faster, it would generate expenditure. So someone in the audience raised his hand or around his table, and he didn't even raise his head, he just said, oh, John, that's just Keynesian economics. So I said to him, if I had said that the earth goes around the sun, not the other way around, would you have said, oh, that's just Copernican astronomy? No, the idea that deficits decline as the economy grow is not Keynesian economics. It's good sense. It's a recognition that the economy is demand constrained. And you might say that the difference between the mainstream of profession and those who are outside of the mainstream or on the edges of it is that 
mainstream economics, even among the best, even among the most progressively minded, such as um, Joseph Stieglitz, make arguments that derive from a full employment framework. <clears throat> that is, they have prices are parametric. Uh, the, <clears throat> even the definition of economics that uh, most people put forward uh, is derives from the view that the economy is at full employment. Economics is a study of the allocation of scarce resources among competing ends. Well, it shouldn't be, because what that statement says is that we are always having to make choices in order to allocate resources which are fully being used, and there's no slack in the system, so it's all about making those hard decisions about where to allocate the resources. In fact, the hard decisions in market economies is how to mobilize all the available resources. And that pretty much was what people considered economics to be 30 or 40 years ago. And some of the people who, did, uh, who viewed it that way were called Keynesians, and others called themselves something different. But enough of that. But in, in that, having said that, uh, there, I, I, I took a photograph about three or four years ago, which sums up my view of the recession and austerity. This was a young man uh, at the um, famous park in New York during the Occupy movement, and uh, he, I would say, had the idea of what was needed correct. Deficit disorder. Well, I'm going to begin with, I could have started with um, a, a quotation from George Osborne or from, uh, <coughs> the, um, uh, from the Prime Minister, but instead uh, I think that the disorder is better shown by a quotation from the Shadow Chancellor, Ed Balls. Now, How did we get to the point where someone from a ostensibly progressive party would talk about credible commitments to deficit reduction, deficit elimination, not even reduction, elimination, iron discipline, um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, so I suppose Mr. Balls thinks he would be an iron chancellor, um, and um, this means making tough choices. How, how did we get to the point where people could say such flagrantly absurd things? And I hope that I'll be able to explain that after I've gone through a few facts. Why do we need the deficit down? It's because it is large and unmanageable. I wonder if there's any place left where undergraduates in economics are taught about government budgets. I'm not talking about public finance and tax incidents and things like that, but are taught, as I was, and probably uh, uh, Philip was, and some of the rest of you here, were taught, you know, what, <laughs> what's a, uh, what's the overall budget, what's the primary budget, <laughs> what's the um, um, uh, cash flow budget, uh, what's difference in, what difference does it make, how you finance it, What's the net aggregate demand effect of the budgets? None of these things come out in the press, or very, very rarely. And so I think one step towards understanding what to do about the deficit and whether we need to do anything about the deficit is you have to measure it correctly. And this gives us a, a simple example. The, uh, <coughs> for, um, this would be, uh, uh, tax year 2013-14, so this is a little bit of past history, but not that past the point uh, it makes is, um, um, we would be the same with the latest statistics. It's something called the overall deficit, and that is basically the uh, total program expenditure minus all the government revenues from different sources. 
I'm not even going to go into the, the primary deficit, which I don't have up here, is uh, that um, deficit minus all interest payments, uh, which is the, the, the deficit, if you go to the IMF manual on uh, deficit, uh, what it's called, I think it's called sound deficit, for sound public finances, you'll see that the IMF recommends that you not use the overall deficit, which by the way is what um, uh, is used in the European Union for the guideline, the famous 3% of GNP, and not use the overall deficit, you should be using the primary deficit, uh, the overall deficit minus interest payments. And uh, if anybody wants to ask why the IMF would uh, uh, suggest that, I'll be glad to talk about it later. But I'm more interested in another, to me, absolutely obvious um, uh, misinterpretation of the deficit that relatively few people uh, point out, and that is if you go to the next uh, bar, which is minus 4% of GNP, that takes out the interest which the British government pays to itself. <laughs> that is, to the Bank of England, about 30% of the British debt is held by the Bank of England. So the payments service that part of the debt, the payments to ourselves. And then there are other government agencies which also hold part of the deficit. So <laughs> we're already down below 5% <coughs> of, you might say, expenditure that, that matters. Then quite a substantial portion of this uh, deficit, uh, 1.1 percentage points is a result of the change in unemployment payments since 2008, which as unemployment declines, will also decline. So that you might call the, <coughs> we're getting closer to some kind of uh, deficit that takes out the cyclical swings. And then if you take out investment, you're down to minus 1.6% of GNP. I want to make two comments on that before I go on. One is, when businesses want to invest, they don't build up a pile of cash, or at least they haven't in about 200 years. <clears throat> they go and borrow the money. And why do they borrow the money? The reason they borrow the money is because they know that if the investment is profitable, then it will produce a flow of income which will pay for itself. So therefore, if you paid for the investment up front, you'd be paying for it twice. <clears throat> you would have funded it, and then it would be funding itself. Why doesn't that apply to governments? Well, actually, it should. If an investment is profitable, it should be funded by borrowing. With one exception, with a, with a very important analytical exception, and that is there might be circumstances when that would generate excess aggregate demand. So if you're close to full potential, the, the economy's potential, then the government has to be very cautious about funding investment through borrowing. Not because <clears throat> that it is unsound in and of itself, but because it can have inflationary effects. That's the type of economics that I, that I learned, you know, back in the antediluvian days, <clears throat> and it seems to me to be absolutely obvious that it makes sense. It makes sense to businesses. There's all, people always say, oh, well, the government should be run like a business. I agree 100%, and when it borrow, when it wants to invest, it should borrow, just like businesses do. Okay, what is the point of this diagram? The first, the first point is that the deficit is a complicated thing. We haven't even got into how it's being financed, <coughs> so we haven't even discussed whether or not the, the net demand effect, <coughs> I would say, when you get down to one point, minus 1.6% 1 of GNP, it's probably having a neutral effect uh, in terms of aggregate, uh, aggregate demand, but that is a very intricate empirical question. So the first problem is that the 
Once you analyze the deficit and look at the parts, it's not much of a problem. Why do we have it? Well, we all know why we have it. <coughs> of course, because the deficit that labor's reckless spending uh, that, uh, uh, that caused the problem, and that now uh, the coalition must sort that uh, uh, problem out. Let me say that I'm not a defender of la labor's record under either Tony Blair or, um, uh, uh, or Gordon Brown. However, there are, I do have a certain belief in the use of statistics and facts. And if you look at the numbers, I'm sorry this has looked a bit messy, but maybe you can read it <coughs> from where you are. On the left-hand side, um, expenditure and revenue are measured in um, uh, billions of uh, uh, pounds. On the right-hand side, uh, the fiscal balance is measured in uh, billions of uh, uh, pounds. If you go back from the second quarter of 2006 up to the last days of the Labour government, <coughs> it had a negative balance of four, 439 billion pounds. This is in uh, constant prices. So about 440 billion pounds. If you <coughs> take the same period of time since the coalition came into power and you measure up to today, well not up to today, to, through the third quarter of, uh, of last year, the, uh, the net balance is minus 525 billion pounds. Now think about that for a moment. Despite the fact that the Labour government faced the worst recession in decades, it had a lower accumulative deficit on expenditure than the coalition has since the crisis. Now, why is that? The reason is, <coughs> the reason is obvious. It's because to me, because the economy has stagnated. And that's what I'm moving to next. The coalition uh, inherited a stagnant economy. As a result of this economic stagnation, the, <coughs> um, uh, it was extremely difficult to lower the, um, uh, get the public finances in in order, and this decline was larger than any other major European country, and this is the burden which um, George Osborne had to bear. Um, it's not true. <coughs> if you look at the final days of the Brown government, you see that <coughs> the growth rate was improving continuously up until the third quarter of 2010 and then began <coughs> to deteriorate. The reason it was improving <coughs> was because of fiscal stimulus, so-called Keynesian uh, uh, economics. Now, it is true that there has been a recovery which began in the early part of 2013, and <clears throat> but it came after a quite prolonged stagnation, which was the result of pursuing expenditure-cutting policies. And I'll come back to this, but now I want to move to the idea that there is a robust recovery going on because it's not true, and the source is none other than the Office of National Statistics. If you go to the, the uh, economic review of the Office of National Statistics from about a year and a half ago, they um, had a diagram, um, uh, they had this diagram, though 
uh, it only went through uh, 19 quarters because of when it came out. I've now extended it to 25 quarters. What this shows is the <coughs> output compared to the, the big, the, the peak of each um, uh, cycle <coughs> before the downturn came. So in the case of um, uh, 1973, the, um, the peak was uh, came in the second quarter, then you got a recession, then you began to get at one, some point to get a recovery. Uh, in 1979, it began in the second quarter. In 1990, it began in the second quarter. 2008, it began in the first quarter. Yes, we're back to where we were in at the beginning of the recession, and it is the slowest recovery on record. Not only is it slightly slow, <coughs> we are the, the slowest that's on that, uh, the second slowest, <coughs> the um, uh, peak output is regained in the seven, 17th quarter after uh, the beginning of the downturn, and we're at regained it this time around at the 25th. So <coughs> if you work that out, that's about two years slower than the previous, the slowest recovery. Now you can say, well, this is a small sample. It's only four recoveries. Uh, <coughs> however, the difference is so striking A difference of two years, a recovery that comes that much later, that is not accidental, I would argue. Now, there are a number of arguments made about why deficits are a bad thing why something should be done about them, and I would like to touch on those because I'm going to argue that they are all either false or conditional. So one argument is that the deficit generates an unsustainable public debt. I haven't marshaled the numbers on this. If you're interested, I can uh, pr provide you with something that I've written and something that uh, other people are, uh, things other people have written. When you look at the, uh, the, the British debt, <coughs> you'll see that it is actually much smaller than the headline because there's a difference between what is called the gross debt <coughs> of the um, uh, public sector and the net debt of the uh, public sector. The net debt takes out <coughs> certain cash assets, such as foreign exchange held in the Bank of England and, uh, <coughs> and other, um, uh, <coughs> we're not talking about the, uh, the value of national, uh, nationalized companies, but actual cash assets. It's well below 100% of GNP, and it's not increasing. That's the first argument that's uh, frequently made. The second argument, which is stressed, is a crowding out argument. That is the idea that when the British government borrows, that leaves less for the private sector to borrow. And so it's like, in, you know, you're taking an uh, the, you get, you're waiting for an elevator, the elevator opens up, absolutely packed. You can only get in if somebody gets out. And that's what happens close to full employment. Then if the government or anybody or, or households or the private sector, businesses try to borrow, the consequence will be that one of the other major players must borrow less. Okay, but if the elevator door opens, elevator's half empty, 
then you can get in and nobody will be crowded out. And here, the evidence is absolutely clear. I take this just through um, the uh, uh, more recent data has um, uh, become available, but this goes through the uh, uh, October of uh, uh, last year. And we see, first of all, that the return on treasury bills is minuscule. I mean, in real terms, it's negative. It has hardly changed. And the relationship between the U.S. dollar and the pound has hardly changed either. The, uh, <coughs> this is partly because of um, the problems with the euro, so that the um, pound has become a haven uh, that uh, investors or speculators, if we can call them by what they are, uh, uh, seek. So there's no evidence that public borrowing has had any impact either on the exchange rate or on borrowing rates. Okay, so wh why why is it necessary to bring the um, uh, uh, bring the deficit down? It can't be used as the, uh, as the um, uh, explanation for, I mean, we don't have evidence of rising uh, bond prices. We don't have evidence of instability about the currency. On the contrary, the currency is now improving. So where are we left? Well, one frequently made argument is about a structural deficit, and I would like to spend a bit of time on that. Philip mentioned a paper of mine, which um, uh, came out in the Review of Political Economy with a special issue on the Eurozone crisis, and in that I tried to, uh, what I'm about to say, I, uh, I look out for uh, uh, six uh, uh, <coughs> European Union uh, uh, countries, all in the Eurozone. <coughs> The argument for structural deficit goes like this. Over the cycle, revenues rise and fall. And expenditures rise and fall. We saw, um, towards the beginning of the talk, I pointed out the, um, uh, uh, that part of the deficit was a result of increase in uh, unemployment. Uh, payments. They'll go down as the economy recovers. Okay, the, the structural deficit, I'm not, I would be interested to know if, if anyone is aware of when that term was first used, because I've tried to chase it down, but I've, I've chased down when it was first used in the, um, by the European Commission. <clears throat> and that was uh, uh, several years ago, but it didn't actually become part of the, formally part of the policy uh, until the passage of what's frequently called the, the fiscal pact. And the argument goes like this. Imagine that the British economy were to move from its current position at less than full capacity, less than full potential, that it were to jump to full potential. If at that point there is a deficit in public finances, it is a structural deficit. There's a structural deficit is that deficit which would exist if we were at full employment under current parameters. And that is a problem because <clears throat> we should have, well, I guess it's a problem because it exists. Um, I find it very difficult to figure out why even that would be a problem. But if you had a view that you ought to balance the budget over the cycle, then a structural deficit is a problem. 
George Osborne uses this term, he repeatedly uses, talks about the British structural deficit. You see it in, in the press. Even um, uh, a very good business, uh, <coughs> economics journalist, Larry Elliott, uses the term. It's complete nonsense. And let me, for many reasons, that's not difficult to explain why. Go to the European Union website and um, look for the explanation of how the structural deficit is measured. You'll find out that, what should be obvious, there must be an estimate at any moment of what full employment or full potential would be. <clears throat> so therefore, we, we can only talk about what the public sector balance would be at full potential if we have an estimate of what full potential is. And you'll discover that there are two ways in which that is measured. There is the production function method, which is what they use in the European Union, and that is, and it is, I, uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say, it is a, they use a simple Cobb-Douglas production function to estimate what output would be if, if everyone who wants work had work at existing levels of productivity. But even that is quite problematical because you need an, even if you accepted the production function approach to, to um, estimating what output uh, uh, would be at different levels of employment, and I don't, but even if you did, you would have to have some mechanism for estimating what maximum employment is. So you've got two things that you have to estimate, both of which are very problematical. <clears throat> One is the link between <coughs> output and employment, and the other is maximum employment. As I understand, in the case of the Treasury, uh, and uh, here this is, <coughs> I haven't been able to actually get a hold of the document, but the estimate is based upon a concept of the natural rate of unemployment. So. <coughs> The, uh, there's an estimate of what would be the rate of unemployment that would lead to a stable rate of inflation, non-accelerating um, uh, rate of inflation. Again, a very problematical concept because it involves the concept of the natural rate of unemployment, or that this, <clears throat> or there's a rate of unemployment, a unique rate of unemployment associated with uh, uh, zero inflation or no change in the rate of inflation. But there's a further problem here. See, you've granted all of that. <coughs> and, you, and you calculated it out and you said, well, if we were close to full employment, suddenly uh, the um, fiscal deficit, the overall fiscal deficit would be 3% of GNP. Well, we know empirically that under unchanged parameters of expenditure and taxes, revenue grows faster than expenditure grows when output grows. So if output were growing at 3%, <coughs> we know that revenue would grow faster than expenditure unless there were new expenditure programs put in place. But of course the idea of a structural deficit assumes that you have unchanged expenditure and revenue parameters. So that means if you have a structural deficit under this definition, you know, we suddenly we jump to full employment and we discover we have 3%, all you have to do is wait. 
because sooner or later the deficit will be eliminated. And that in the paper that I did in Review of Political Economy, basically I attempted to measure that. I asked the question, given <coughs> the present deficit, and this the uh, given journals, it was the, this was data way back in uh, uh, for uh, 2011, <coughs> given available uh, data, given normal growth rates, how long would it take each country to eliminate its deficit? And it turns out that they're all less than, the answer to all of them is less than three years with the exception of Greece. Greece was the only country for which a much longer period would be required <coughs> to eliminate the deficit. And that's why it was the first country to suffer a, um, uh, a crisis of uh, public uh, finances. Okay, so where are we left here? we're saying is that this concept of fiscal deficit comes from a particular view, a static view of the economy, that the deficit is something which is independent of any dynamic process and it must be eliminated within sort of that static analytical uh, uh, framework. Now, at this point, I'll try to uh, finish up with um, um, a few um, insights. Well, I hope the insights uh, are suggestions for where we go from here. First, I think that um, at this moment, the economists have a particular responsibility to try to render the debate about public, public finances uh, in a more rational and reasonable context. And to try to shift a discussion from this very narrow view that a deficit is a problem that must be eliminated. On the face of it, is a, uh, it's, it's a problem. And debt is a problem. And therefore, steps need to be taken to eliminate these problems. This is getting very close to um, a use of the word debt and deficit uh, similar to in German. You know, in German the same word for guilt and, uh, and debt, um, and that's been pointed out by many people and many people have suggested, well, maybe this is a problem with the Bundesbank. Uh, uh, <coughs> but if we could get out of the idea that deficits are a bad thing, when you come to a recession, deficits are a good thing. Deficits are not, were not the problem in 2010. The fiscal deficit was the solution, not the problem, in the sense that through the recession generating a fiscal deficit, it softened the decline of the economy because it meant that outflows, leakages, as we used to call them, were less than injections, <coughs> so that the rate in which the government was contributing the net, its net contribution to aggregate demand was rising as the recession proceeded. And that's what a deficit is. It shows a growing net contribution by the public sector to um, uh, aggregate demand. All right, so I finish by saying I urge you to you know, write to your MP, <laughs> uh, write, uh, write to your local newspaper, uh, <coughs> try to generate a view of uh, public finances which uh, is a rational one in which deficits and debt aren't viewed as 
can surmount our, our problems that must be surmounted. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for a comprehensive analysis.